Welcome back to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Cressy, and this is episode 199. I'm going to be flying solo for today's episode, and it's one that I think is actually really overdue. I've been meaning to record this for quite some time, and I just got around to gather my thoughts on it and putting them down on paper. So I'm going to be working through some notes as we talk about this. And, you know, really, I think a lot of people have this perception of Cressy Sports Performance that we only deal with professional athletes, and that actually couldn't be uh, further from the truth. Um, we have a strong amateur contingent of middle school, high school, and college athletes at both our Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, and Hudson Mass facilities. So we've seen a long track record of, of athletic development specific to this baseball realm. We had 251 players drafted since 2012, and that doesn't even include free agent signings. And we've actually seen athletes through entire major league careers with over 10 years of big league service time. But what's probably most interesting is, is since we opened in 2007, we've actually had a lot of middle school and high school athletes who are now pitching in the big leagues. So we've seen them through their amateur days on the early side, middle school and high school, into the college ranks and then into the professional ranks. So we've picked up a lot of strategies that I think will really help people to stay on the right path um, and course correct if they're on the wrong path. So again, we're gonna talk about a lot of big picture strategies here, but if you're someone that does want some help with the specifics of program design, coaching cues and long-term development modeling we're really happy to help um, just head to cressysportsperformance.com and click get started to learn more about our offerings uh, we have both in-person and remote training a lot of people don't realize that our expertise is available you know really across the nation and the world not just if you're available at one of our facilities so again that's cressysportsperformance.com click get started fill out the information form and we'll see if it's a good fit this episode is brought to you by AG1, the most comprehensive NSF certified for sport daily nutritional supplement I've ever tried. With so many stressors in life, it can be difficult to maintain effective nutritional habits and give our bodies the nutrients they need to thrive. As a father of three young kids and a co-founder of multiple businesses in multiple states on top of still being an avid exerciser, I know that busy schedules can really take their toll on us. Whether it's poor sleep, exercise or life stressors, environmental factors, or simply not eating enough of the right foods, we can often wind up deficient nutritionally. This is where AG1 can really help. It's a game-changing nutritional insurance policy. They simplify the logistics of getting optimal nutrition on a daily basis by giving you just one thing with all the best things. That's why I use it daily, as do several of my family members, and we recommend it to a lot of our top athletes. One scoop of AG1 contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients that work together to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet to support energy, focus, digestion, and recovery. And this can all happen for less than $3 per day and without taking multiple products. While most nutritional supplements come to market and stay stagnant, AG1 continues to obsessively improve this one holistic formula based on the latest research, producing over 50 improvements in the last decade alone. They invest in the most absorbable and natural source of each ingredient and go above and beyond in third-party testing to ensure their customers continue to receive the highest quality and best tasting nutrition habit on the planet. Whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, it'll work for you, and it contains less than one gram of sugar per serving. They put 75 ingredients through the rigorous NSF certification test to come up with a safe formula that's trusted by some of the world's top athletes, including many of our own at Cressy Sports Performance. Right now, AG1 is giving our listeners a special offer of 10 free travel packets with their first purchase. Just head to drinkag1.com backslash Cressy and claim this special offer. These travel packets are perfect for supporting your immune system, energy, and gut health while you're traveling for games, training, or simply on the go. They can be great counterbalance to the less than ideal on the road food options that are out there for a lot of our traveling baseball players. So if you want to bridge the gap between deficient and optimal and give yourself the best chance of getting nutrient diversity, head to drinkag1.com backslash Cressy to get 10 free travel packets with your first purchase. Again, that's drinkag1.com backslash Cressy, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y. You won't regret it. I'm going to jump right into this episode simply because I think I did a lot of the intro uh, to the intro to this specific podcast. So we'll talk about it. As, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've had athletes who have been middle school athletes and high school athletes who are now pitching in the big leagues who have done some really remarkable things over, you know, a short but successful athletic career that's still continuing. But unfortunately, we've also seen athletes who didn't reach their potential for a variety of factors. And I wanted to outline some of those factors in today's podcast. 
Um, this might go against the grain a little bit. I know we have a lot of parents and coaches and kids that listen to these these podcasts. So there may be some things that rock the boat with respect to how you've approached your athletic development. But I do think they're conversations that need to be had so that we can you know, really have a, a, a transparent process of athletic development for all the, the kids that are out there. Um, the first mistake that I see is, is when young kids and their parents compare themselves to other athletes. And I'll speak more personally with this. Uh, my wife gave birth to our twin daughters in 2014. And parenthood is always very eye-opening for folks, but it was particularly eye-opening for me as a, a father of, of twin daughters, seeing them be entirely different, even on the ultrasounds before she gave birth. We had one daughter that was olive skin. My wife is Lebanese and Italian, and I'm kind of a pasty white Irish English guy. Um, so our other daughter has pale skin like I do. We had a blonde and a brunette. Um, we have a lefty and a righty. We have one that literally will do 10 hours of gymnastics every day. The other one, uh, I'm doing this podcast on a Sunday night. She got a book on Thursday and she's currently on page 720. She loves to read. Uh, more of an introvert can go into a corner for, for three hours and do her thing. Um, you know, one of them walked, you know, seven months before the other one. Um, another one swam much, much sooner. One came around much sooner on the verbal side of things. Um, they could not be more different, even though pretty much 99.9% .9 of their life has been spent together, including in the womb. So I really come you tell this story a lot just because I think far too many parents compare their kids uh, to the kid down the street, the other kid on their team. And the truth is that, you know, even at the highest level, big leaguers come in all shapes and sizes. There are many, many different ways to be successful athletically. But kids, I really can't overstate enough that really everything goes out the window until after puberty. Um, you know, we see kids that are so dramatically different. And then at age 13, some of them shoot up eight inches in six months. And all of a sudden they become the, the, the biggest, fastest, strongest kid on the team. So I really think we need to take into account that the early years are so much about uh, developing global movement competency, really building a really strong foundation, um, because that's something that doesn't go out the window. And, and unfortunately, the only other thing that doesn't go out the window is your injury history. Um, and, and a study that I often cite in these conversations is actually a Japanese study. Um, Okamoto in 2016 looked at Japanese boys and girls ages 9 to 12 who were participating in, in youth baseball. And they took this study and they actually excluded kids who were not actively playing because of elbow pain or tenderness at examination. So players who had a past history of elbow pain or tenderness, but no symptoms at the time of the exam were included. So basically what they did was they, they took a whole bunch of kids who you know, weren't reporting symptoms, and then they went and they MRI'd them. And this is a Japanese study of nine to 12 year olds. 42% of them had UCL damage on MRI. So they had uh, ulnar collateral ligaments that were partially compromised. And when they actually looked at the ones that, that identified as pitchers, it was 63%. So this is a, a pretty eye-opening thing. We, we often see diagnostic imaging, and I've done an entire podcast on this, so definitely go back and, and listen to it. Um, but we often see crazy things on diagnostic imaging in, in college and professional players at the highest levels. But this is pretty eye-opening to see so much damage in elbows of 9 to 12 year olds. And you don't need to look any further than the mean training hours per week in this study. The average 9 to 12 year olds in this study were doing 12 hours and 48 minutes of training per week. So if, if you do the math on that, that's five days a week, you know, basically between two and three hours of practices. Um, at that age, that's a lot. And what was most fascinating about that, though, is the standard deviation was five hours and 18 minutes. So you can, you can do the math. You had kids that were training baseball 20 hours a week. It's a, it's a very significant amount of, uh, of commitment to overhand throwing, things like that, that could uh, basically create structural deviations from normalcy. So at the end of the day, I think we often see parents and kids who get pulled and pulled and pulled to play year-round baseball, to, to play for two different teams at once, um, to not take periods of time off. But in reality, um, there's such an important role for you know, for them to actually take a little bit of break from baseball, whether it's just to recover, um, but also to go and get exposed to a variety of different athletic stressors. Go play soccer, play football, play basketball, um, be exposed to a wide variety of, of athletic endeavors that help to build that, that rich proprioceptive environment and a really foundational global movement competency. I, I can't overstate it enough. 
This actually leads me to my second mistake that I want to highlight, and it's flipping the athletic development pyramid upside down. So I, I have a graphic that I often post on social media just as a reminder for folks, and it's really a pyramid that shows how we attack pitching development. And the foundation is functional strength. The next category up is stability, and then mobility, and then power, and then mechanics, and then work capacity and pitch design. So the idea is if you have some global strength, and you have the stability to get into important positions in your delivery, you can also then layer some power, right? Power is your ability to exert force quickly. If you're not strong, you can exert force quickly. And then once we've done those four things, then we can start to talk about mechanics that are right for your body. Once you're moving efficiently, once you've got that, you build some work capacity. And work capacity is skill specific, right? I, I often use the analogy of Lance Armstrong kind of being an average marathoner after being the best cyclist on the planet. It was a totally foreign movement to him that he had to pick up on. So once we develop the mechanics, the delivery that we want, whether it's hitting or pitching, then we need to layer skill specific work capacity on it. We need to gradually build up pitch count. We need to gradually do more and more BP rounds to get to a point where we can tolerate that workload. And then then at the top of it is, is pitch design. So obviously we, we see way too often kids that want to race to learn a sweeper or some kind of new pitch and throw it and throw it and throw it and they wind up having Tommy John surgery. It's because they went really specific. So what we don't want to do is flip this pyramid upside down where we take someone who's really untrained, right? They, they can't touch their toes. They have no global strength. They can't do a side bridge for more than five seconds. They're not powerful enough to, to vertical jump 12 inches. The last thing that those kids need to do is really, really hone in on an aggressive throwing program. They definitely don't need to go out and throw 115 pitches every week. And they certainly don't need to chase really advanced pitches. These are often the kids that need really foundational training. They need to learn how to hold a fastball. They need to understand how to take pride in their catch play. And they need to understand how to be really consistent throughout the year so that they can build an appreciable amount of work capacity that's going to give rise to a lot of other things. Unfortunately, we see a lot of people who flip this pyramid upside down and they chase something that's too specific, right? So you need to be a very, very good generalist before you're specific. Um, so I talk a lot about having good uh, breadth to your training as opposed to just, just good depth. We want to make sure that we, we're exposed to a variety of different principles to give us that good foundation. And then we can start to layer a lot more specific adaptation on top of that. And it really relates back to not preparing, not comparing kids what we see all too often is the 12 year old who's got a good curveball he goes and he gets overused what we actually probably should be doing with that 12 year old is protecting him from you know from people out there who might want to overuse him and and really throw him out there to win games when we should be looking at him as a what making him what makes him spectacular is also making him susceptible for point number three we can actually talk a little about what protects those kids. Um, you know, so the biggest mistake that I see with respect to strength training is cutting it out. So all too often we see kids that have these amazing off seasons, you know, and they, they work out, you know, basically from October 1st, all the way through the, the second week in March, and then they disappear and they want to come back at the end of August. And all too often they've taken some really big steps back. Um, we had a really good podcast just recently with Dr. William Kramer, um, who is, you know, one of the, the godfathers of strength and conditioning research has just put so much wonderful stuff out there. And he talked about the importance of strength training for kids as it, it's protective. It, it basically actually shields them from a, a negative or a hyper response to future stressors. Um, there's some really favorable adaptations that come about, not just in terms of, of building strength and, and obviously enhancing you know joint stability and things like that, but we also seen a good immune response. We see endocrine benefits, all these different things that, that help to keep us healthy and performing at a really high level. So we do need to sustain that throughout the year. All too often, we see kids that, that really pull back once the season gets going and they, they actually detrain pretty significantly and, and often lose body weight. So my good rule of thumb is that in young athletes, 
each month off from strength training takes two months to get back. Um, and you can see how this would magnify over the course of a high school career. Probably the best example I can give for this is if you actually look at what's happening around Tommy John's. And we, we scrutinize force plate data really, really closely around UCL reconstruction athletes. If you think about what happens when someone injures an elbow, there's usually kind of the initial pain, loss of function. There's five to seven days where they're not really in a good spot to do anything. They're probably going and seeing doctors, trying to get appointments. In many cases, once they're told they need surgery, there's a week or two where they're waiting before they can get it. Then they have the surgery. They're, you know, they're on painkillers. They're, you know, mobilized for, you know, seven to 10 days before they really get switched over to a brace that's a little more, more functional. And it's really, you know, for most of those athletes up to six to eight weeks before they can start to sprint after that surgery, which is probably your best way to train power. Um, so what we see actually in these athletes is they actually lose a lot of power during that eight or so weeks where they're kind of on the shelf slash having surgery. They actually detrain really, really fast. And what we've found is even when we push them really, really fast, those force plate numbers only get back to baseline around 16 weeks poke stop. So they what they lose in eight, if you're right on the money and doing a good job, you can regain in the next eight. Most of the time though, athletes take a little bit longer than that. And we don't see them you know, back to their pre-surgery force plate numbers until about the time they start to play catch at five months. So this is a really, really big deal. Um, what it does is, you know, it certainly gives us a, a you know, guiding principles for trying to find creative ways to train power. And, and certainly we want to strength train our athletes while they're on the mend um, from that elbow. But it also gives us a lot of ideas for what we can do with healthy athletes. We need to counsel them on how quickly they can detrain, particularly if they're really untrained athletes in the first place. Someone who only has a year of strength training experience experience who goes and takes you know six to eight weeks off during the season is going to lose a lot more than the athlete who has been lifting for for 10 years consistently who you know misses a couple of sessions because of travel or sickness or just being exhausted from game participation they have more of a buffer so the lesson here is is don't cut out strength training in fact early in your career when the games don't matter nearly as much you should push to do it even if you are tired because it's going to have such pronounced protective benefits and it's also going to create you know a scenario where you have a good foundation that allows you to buy a little bit more time off later in your career so strength training should be a year-round thing for young athletes um you know i I can't overstate enough how, how important it is for kids to also get involved in it early. I think 12, 13, 14, they're kind of the perfect ages to get going. You know, at 12 and 13, just be curious twice a week, um, learn the patterns, nothing too crazy. And then 14 to 16, you kind of start to shift into like more of a three day a week type program. Um, and then obviously once you get to 17, 18, you might get a little bit more in line with what you would see with college athletes with, you know, a four to six day a week, um, you know, training program. Obviously it also integrates med ball and plyometrics and all of that stuff too so you want to gradually get more and more exposures to this and and you know an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure so so putting a little bit of work in at age 11 12 13 can make a world of a difference for an athlete um, i remember mike boyle talking about um, just making sure that his kids average two lifts a week from age 11 on so you know when they're younger it was probably one or two and by the time you know they're you know, up to seniors in high school, it's probably four. Um, but you look at what that actually means, you know, basically seven years, you know, 52 weeks in the year, it's a 104, you know, lifts each year times seven years. That's, that's a big deal. If you can log, you know, between seven to 800 sessions over that time period, don't wait until you get to college. Um, and certainly don't cut it out. Once you've gotten started, you want to, you want to build that momentum and continue to train during the season. Mistake number four is simply wasting reps. Um, I, I've often grabbed high school kids and encouraged them to come and watch our pro guys play catch. And if you don't have that at your fingertips, you know, next time you go to a major league game, try to get there early and go watch pitchers stretch, you know, in the outfield when those players are out there playing pregame catch. Um, they're always really, really locked in their catch play. They're always working on something. They're always fine tuning things. They're not talking like crazy between every throw. Instead, they're, they're super locked in to whatever it is they need to work on. And we see way too much mess around with younger kids during catch play you know the, the name of the game with baseball is is repeatability understanding how to do the same thing over and over again with a very narrow window of variation um, and the same is true in the cages right 
pro guys are always extremely consistent in their cage sessions because they know that wasting reps is, is not only going to be bad for motor learning, but it's also going to beat you up, right? You don't want to waste a bunch of reps, um, you know, in the cages because it's going to, you know, basically leave you with cranky wrists and oblique strains and cranky lower backs. You just don't see big leaguers who hit until their hands bleed because they understand that being efficient with their rounds, being efficient with their work is really important, particularly when we're talking about a long season. And, and one of the, the charts that I like to show folks is, is the, the unconscious competence to conscious competence continuum. So if you think about what happens when you're unconsciously incompetent, you're, you're completely unaware of the skill and you lack any kind of proficiency to execute it. So it's as if I hand you a baseball and you don't even know how to hold it, right? I need you to throw a four seam. You don't even know where to put your fingers. Um, you're just grabbing it and throwing a palm ball, right? That's unconscious incompetence. The next step is, is conscious incompetence, right? You, you understand what the skill is supposed to be, but you just haven't grasped it. You're, you're not proficient at all. So in that situation, hey, I've shown you, here's how you hold a four seam fastball. And you know here's what I want you to do with your delivery. We demonstrate it, we go through it, but you just simply can't get it, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work. And what you need to do is you need to spend some time in this, this conscious incompetence to try to self-organize and figure things out. And you, you progress to this next stage, which is conscious competence. You're, you're able to use the skill, but you have to really, really think about it. You have to have effort. This is the part where it's hard to be competitive, right? You have to be kind of inherently analytical because you're trying to master it. These are the times when we try to put athletes in situations where they can fail without consequences, right? Fail forward. And then eventually you get enough conscious competence reps in and you develop unconscious competence, right? This is when the skill becomes, you know, second nature. It's completely automatic. You don't have to think about it, right? This is, you know, Roger Federer hitting a forehand, you know, on a full run in a tennis match at Wimbledon in a big spot. Everything just kind of works, right? So you see this a lot with position players making, you know, elite plays on, on balls they don't have time to think about. All these things are a function of having so many high quality reps now here's the problem. When you play lazy catch play, when you talk during every swing, um, you know, in the cages, when you're just wasting reps left and right, what you're actually doing is you're setting yourself back. You're getting further away from unconscious competence because you're sending all these mixed signals to your brain and your body on, on what you're trying to actually execute. So the biggest takeaway from this is be mature, be locked in, take pride in your work, and it will set you up for a longer term success. We interrupt this podcast with a quick reminder that this episode is brought to you by AG1. It's an NSF certified all-in-one superfood supplement that features 75 whole food sourced ingredients designed to support your body's nutritional needs. I use this product daily myself and a ton of our athletes do as well. Head to drinkag1.com backslash Cressy and claim my special offer of 10 free travel packets with your first purchase. AG1 gives you peace of mind that you're covering all your nutritional bases. Again, that's drinkag1.com backslash Cressy, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y, and you'll get that special offer. For mistake number five, I don't like to see athletes who chase a delivery or swing that doesn't align with their archetype. So what that means is, uh, probably better illustrated with an example, for a long time we saw a bunch of athletes that walked in who all wanted to throw like Tim Lincecum, right? And there was the Uraldis Chapman, there was the Jacob deGrom era, you know, whoever kind of the high performing hard thrower in Major League Baseball was, a lot of young athletes wanted to emulate. And, and the challenge is, one, you might not have a body that moves like that individual. And, and two, uh, you might not be big and strong enough to even execute that delivery safely. So what we've actually learned to do is, is more of an archetype driven approach. In other words, we take a step back, we look at each athlete as completely unique. In other words, we, we go through the range of motion assessments, we look at infrasternal angle, we look at anthropometric characteristics like you know finger length, arm length, height, weight, all those things. We look at laxity, are you hypermobile or not? We look at injury history, we look at weight, age, we look at physiological profile, right? Things like, do you sleep well? Are you on any medications? Um, we look at how you know much sport-specific motor control you have. Do you have good stability at all the requisite end ranges it takes? Um, do you have good work pass? How do you look on our force velocity profiling, on our force plates, and our Proteus tests? 
we look at, you know, are you a real like sagittal plane monster? You move really good straight ahead, but you don't rotate really well. What's your, what's your plane bias? We look at whether you're kind of a pronator or a supinator. So in other words, you know, do you have a lot of radial deviation or ulnar deviation um, through your wrist? We look at your natural arm slot. Are you, are you really comfortable with a lower slot? Are you a little bit of a higher slot? Maybe because you, you lack shoulder external rotation. We look at your training history, right? Are you a, a guy that got crazy strong in the weight room and lost a bunch of range of motion? Or are you someone that is a real kind of novice in the weight room and, and could benefit from putting some strength in? Um, we look at the time frame of year, right? If we get somebody two weeks before spring training, it's really hard to overhaul a delivery right there. We're, we're kind of fine tuning at the absolute most. And obviously we look at the competitive, competitive calendar, like what's ahead for you? Do we have a little bit more time before gameplay is taking place where we have to actually do a little bit more developmental work? So all this stuff just speaks to like the idea that we need to have a very individualized approach. I think the archetype of wide versus narrow and versus narrow angles is probably the thing that can drive the most specific behaviors with respect to what movement should be optimized. And this is something that we do a lot, particularly with our, our Thea markerless biomechanics side of things. But what I would just say for the for the casual, you know, baseball parent or coach and, and kid out there who's trying to figure out the best delivery for their body types, think a lot more about looking for people who move like you as opposed to just who the latest freak is on TV pitching in a major league baseball game. Because in many cases, you may be asking your body to do something that it's just not capable of doing. So over the years, we built out a really substantial data set of, of pro arms, college arms, high school arms, just to figure out how it is that we can best sync things up. The single most you know impactful thing that we've really, really done, um, particularly with respect to the pitching side of things, is making sure that our skill coaches have access to all of our strength and conditioning evaluations. So what we're trying to do is create this high level of synergy where, hey, if this athlete has zero degrees of hip and turn rotation on their back leg, Maybe we need to open them up a little bit more on the rubber to give them a little bit more of an ER starting position so that hip doesn't get too pinchy. Oh, this, this kid doesn't have shoulder extra rotation. Maybe he's a guy who's probably going to have a little bit more of a high release height. Okay, hey, this is a kid who has that high release height. It's going to be really hard to teach him a sweeper from that, that release point. So just understanding how athletes move before you throw mechanical uh, solutions at them, I think is vitally important. It's, it's somewhere where we've really differentiated ourselves in the industry. For our sixth mistake, I have something that'll make all of the parents happy out there because they typically like it when someone else can deliver this message because their teenager won't listen to them. And that's simply that, you know, it's a mistake for young athletes to not recognize how much of a difference quality sleep and nutrition can make um, in terms of being competitive advantages. Um, and I do think it's getting a little bit better with respect to the sleep side of things. Credit to, you know, folks like you know, LeBron James, Steph Curry, J.J. Watt, a lot of those people who have spoken very publicly about, you know, sleeping eight to nine hours or more at night and adding naps. But there was a recent study that showed over half of Olympic athletes reported inadequate sleep and they averaged only six hours and 10 minutes per night. Um, you know, prioritizing, prioritizing sleep is a massive competitive advantage for athletes at all level. You see so many athletes um, who, are, who are stockpiling more than 10 hours a day and it makes a huge, huge difference for them. Um, you know, interestingly as well, like if you look at just the beneficial effects of, of just hydration, you know, when you lose one or more percent of body weight, you know, you start to impair, you know, sports performance. When you're dehydrated by as little as 2%, athletes can experience delayed reaction time, decreased accuracy, and increased risk for soft tissue injuries. Once dehydration goes over 4% of body weight, you're looking at some serious health consequences, the consequences, things like heat exhaustion, heat stroke, those are really big uh, problems. Additionally, um, you know, a, a dehydration percentage of only 3% can cause a 10% loss in muscle strength, 8% loss in speed. So these are really foundational things that can make such a huge difference for athletes. And, and I would argue that the overwhelming majority of young athletes are so bad with respect to sleep, hydration, and quality food intake that they really don't even know what it's like to feel at their best. Um, this is something a lot of people gain with age. And we do see a lot of the really, really durable athletes, those who are playing into their late 30s and early 40s, there are people that really pay attention to sleep, hydration, and nutrition. Um, one of the best places I think for athletes to start is with smoothies. Um, a lot of young athletes don't love vegetables and they don't drink enough water. So a smoothie is kind of like a good way to sneak some, some fruits and vegetables in with them, get them some high quality protein, 
get them sufficient calories to support training and also get them you know quite a bit of fluids at the same time so i love this as kind of like a an upstream way to check a few different boxes and then with respect to the sleep side of things one of the things that i, I think is the, the biggest culprit is the exposure to artificial light things like cell phones ipads tvs and the hours before bedtime i always try to tell athletes to reduce exposure to these things in the hours before sleep but if you do want to use them you know you can go to blue light glasses to, to block some of that out you can also set your phone to a night slash dark mode to limit the blue light exposure um, but at the end of the day you know try to make your room as cold and dark as possible try to establish a really good bedtime routine um, i always talk with athletes about every hour before midnight being worth two hours after midnight, um, particularly because in the morning, it's sometimes really, really hard to make up on sleep. If you get to bed early and you do have a rocky night of sleep, you have a buffer on the tail end. If you go to bed at two and you have a rocky night of sleep, you're playing way from behind the eight ball trying to make it up when you still got to be up for class at, you know, at 8 a.m. or whatever it may be. Um, I do know there's some, you know, some interesting nationwide kind of moves to, to start school later so that teenagers can get more sleep. And this is just more proof in the pudding that, you know, athletes need extra sleep. Um, they need high quality nutrition and they, they need to hydrate really well. So what I would tell you is don't wait on this. This is something that's really, really easy. It's a massive competitive advantage. It's independent of genetic potential. You know, we have athletes that are just, you know, freaks that, that roll out of, out of the womb and are, are meant to be major leaguers. And we have other folks that have to work at it much, much more. And this is a way for you to really easy, uh, easily distinguish yourself. So take care of sleep, hydration, nutrition, and really good things happen. Last but certainly not least, number seven, chasing too many showcases. Um, I've been very outspoken about my criticism of showcases, um, largely because they take place at the wrong time of year, right? Kids play baseball for an extended period of time, and then showcases often happen when it's convenient for coaches uh, and you know various you know organizations to basically run these as a money grab. Um, I think the the problem with these is you know they take place at times of year when pitchers aren't ready to showcase. They generally tend to be really max effort um, initiatives at times when when athletes aren't super prepared. And we certainly there's a high association with injury risk. You know we saw this all the way back in 2006 in studies from Olson, um, but just more recently Dr. Peter Chris who did a great podcast with us um, talked about that association with injury risk as we do see more and more problems with athletes who participate in showcases beyond just the the injury risk though it does push out you know important training time it breaks up the continuity of training really disrupts the competitive year and and i'm a big believer though is that you know the off season is a time to create something worth showcasing so outside of situations where you know you have seniors who aren't committed and they really need to try to find a play to place to play in college you know that might be more justified conversely if we're talking about you know 13 14 15 year old kids going to showcases really ever it, it doesn't make sense um you know if you are going to showcase try to do it within the windows of when pitchers are you know for lack of a better term hot when they're ready to go and actually do this um, unfortunately this is the direction that, that baseball is really going i was i was telling the story the other day that we have a a really good high school player uh, player who was fully healthy all year committed to an sec school as a rising uh, senior he'll be a draft prospect and he only threw 17 innings this year it's because nowadays the industry is you know really conditioned to throw one or two innings every weekend um so it's it's a low workload but it's at a high velocity high intent level so i'm not necessarily sure that this is a great long-term strategy for our young pitchers and it's, it's certainly not the way we're going to build you know big leaguers who are going to make 30 to 35 stars and you know throw up 180 to 200 innings so i do think the future of baseball is, is unfortunately kind of headed in the wrong direction with how youth arms are managed um, and i would like to see us get back to the day when when athletes are are really conditioned to pitch a little bit more in actual games versus trying to be rerouted to so many showcases but i understand there are people that want to make money and scouts that want to take notes so this is unfortunately the, the cards that we've been dealt that wraps up my seven most common mistakes among youth athletes. I'm sure there are many, many more that I've overlooked. These are really just the first seven uh, that came to mind. And, and again, these were just big picture strategies 
But if you are someone that could use a little bit more direction, um, some help with the specifics of how to write a good program, want to get some coaching cues, some, some technique advice, and really just have conversations about long-term development modeling, um, this is really what we do all day, every day with our amateur athletes. Um, like I said, a lot of people think we're just for pros, but we have a, a, you know, a strong group of, of younger guys um, and girls that are, that are training at our facilities. So if you're interested in learning more, just head to CressySportsPerformance.com, click Get Started enter some information about yourself and we'll go back and forth about whether you're a good fit for either our in-person or online training. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in and have a great week.